Hey everyone, uh, today we are going to talk about gamma exposure. I'm very excited for this video because I have some unpopular and some popular opinions on how to actually use gamma and gamma exposure to actually make plays, earn some money, earn profits, do all kinds of uh, stuff with theoretics, with our tools and just sort of in general as well. So let's uh, dive into all of this stuff right away. Uh, this video is sort of both for beginners and for experts because there are some insights that uh, I would hope you have not uh, heard anywhere else. They are coming from all the data analysis that we have done and our, our, our gamma exposure charts are slightly different as well. Uh, but without further uh, ado, uh, let's start. So we are going to talk about what gamma is. So gamma is the uh, change in the delta of an options contract as the underlying stock price moves. So let's assume delta is 0 0.5 of an options contract and gamma is 0 0.1. If the stock price goes from 400 to 401, delta is going to increase from 0 0.5 to 0 0.6 because gamma was 0 0.1. Now when delta increases, gamma increases as well. And let's say now gamma becomes 0 0.15. Now if the price uh, increases from 401 to 402, delta is going to go from 0 0.6 to 0 0.75. So it's a very abstract definition. A really good way that I think about gamma is gamma is a speed uh, or momentum effect. Uh, so as price is increasing, gamma since gamma keeps increasing and it also keeps increasing the delta, uh, this can cause a very sort of momentum effect, which is what we saw with things like uh, with things like GameStop uh, AMC last year. And so this this causes these gamma squeezes because it's it's it's, it's it causes exponential moves since it's it's increasing and then it it's also increasing the delta as well. So that's what gamma is. What is gamma exposure? So gamma exposure, you just take in gamma uh, for a contract, you multiply it with the open interest for that contract, which would be all the contracts that are held by uh, customers right now. And that gives you uh, the gamma. And then you just sum, th that gives you the gamma exposure for each con for one contract. Then you just sum that up uh, for all contracts and that gives you uh, the gamma exposure for the entire stock. That is what you are seeing right uh, here. So gamma means gamma exposure and these each bar is a normalized uh, value of the gamma over the last year. So now we know about gamma and gamma exposure. Uh, but while we're talking about gamma exposure, the, the, the very first Greek that everyone knows when they start trading options is delta exposure or delta. Why don't we talk about delta exposure? This is a very important concept that not many beginners know. So now we need to talk about a uh, dealer positioning and delta hedging. So anytime you buy a call contract, and I'll just start with a call contract because it's easy to explain. Anytime, let's assume you, you buy a call contract, someone has to provide you liquidity and someone has to sell you that call contract. And that seller uh, or that liquidity provider here is the market maker. Uh, so you are buying a call, the market maker is going to sell you a call. Selling a call is the bearish position and market makers never want to have a direction in the market. They are there to provide you liquidity and that's all. They are going to profit off of the uh, bid ask spread. So that's all. That's their main job. So they don't really want to take a direction, but they just had to take one because you were buying a call and they had to sell you a call. Now, in order to hedge that, uh, they are going to look at the delta of your call. Let's say it's 0 0.5 uh, and they are going to multiply it with 100 because each option is again uh, gives you the ability to sort of trade 100 contracts. Uh, 100 shares, not contracts, uh, they're going to take in the delta of your uh, contract and they're going to multiply it with 100, that's 50. So whatever position now that they had to take because you wanted to buy a call, they're going to go against that position. So if they're selling you a call and that means they're bearish, they're going to buy 50 shares of that particular stock that you are trading in options for. So let's say for S&P, you buy a $400 call uh, and they're going to sell you that $400 call and then they are going to they are going to buy 50 shares of S&P. Now they are delta hedged because the delta of that contract is fully hedged. So now if the price moves up one dollar, let's say, uh, the, uh, if the price moves up one dollar and delta goes from 0 0.5 to 0 0.6, uh, there though the shares that they bought are also going to go up, but the call that they sold is going to go down in value. So the, the shares that they have bought and the call that they have sold are going to offset profits and that's what delta hedging is. But hopefully you'll be able to realize by now that delta hedging alone is not enough because we have gamma, we just talked about it. It is the change in delta. So delta is always changing. It's not static hedging. As gamma and delta changes, they have to change the underlying shares that they just bought. 
they have to either buy more shares if delta keeps increasing and then gamma keeps increasing as well if delta decreases then they have to short those or sell those or cover those uh, or, or sell those shares not cover those shares they have to sell the shares that they just bought so then that's what dynamic hedging is and so anytime you buy a contract uh, dealers are so sophisticated these days that they are right away delta hedging that contract so the delta part of it gets removed immediately and that is why we never talk about delta gamma is the part that keeps changing uh, and gamma is the part that they really need to care about apart from when and charm flows which we'll talk about in some other video but delta isn't something that they're that they're worried about they're worried about gamma and gamma exposure is where this sort of this whole thing of uh, trying to understand what gamma exposure is and then trying to use it to predict market moves or actually just sort of anticipate different kinds of scenarios so i uh, just wanted to discuss why we don't talk about delta because when i started i did not know why people were just talking about gamma and not delta delta is always uh, fully hedged it's a gamma that causes those dealers to then start to dynamically hedge and that's where we, we can get some alpha from so now that we know about uh, why delta does not matter let's talk about gamma exposure again so we talked about uh, how to calculate gamma exposure you uh, take in uh, the gamma multiplied with open interest then sum some sum of everything uh, that's uh, not really good that's one way of calculating gamma exposure but it's not good so now that we know uh, now that we are saying it's not good let's talk about why so now we are going to talk about long and short gamma exposure what we are seeing here is negative gamma which means short gamma and this is a chart for dealer positioning so these are positions for dealers so we are seeing here that for s p dealers have been short gamma over the last one year now what does short versus long gamma means anytime you are buying a contract you are long gamma and anytime you are selling a contract you are short gamma so if dealers are short gamma since they are taking the opposite trades uh, of us uh, that means that customers have been buying both calls and puts or just calls or just puts but they have been buying contracts because then they have a positive gamma and then dealers have negative gamma what if dealers had positive gamma what if dealers have negative gamma how does that affect the stock price or volatility or things like that so when dealers have positive gamma let's talk about that example first because there were obviously some days where dealers had positive gamma exposure when dealers have positive gamma or positive gamma exposure then as the price goes up since gamma is the change in delta as the price goes up one dollar since gamma is positive dealer gamma is positive the deltas of the dealers are going to increase by the amount that gx is giving us and so when the deltas increase remember they want to stay delta hedged and this is where dynamic hedging kicks in they want to short in order to stay delta hedged so when price goes up they are actually required to short if they are positive gamma when price goes down their deltas decrease because gamma is positive uh, their deltas decrease they have to buy back uh, their short positions and that causes the price to go up so positive gamma can cause a pinning effect or can cause a stabilizing force in the market because whatever the price is doing dealers have to do the opposite of that and that can uh, pin a price what happens if they are negative gamma as we are seeing in this uh, screenshot here if they are negative gamma then as price goes up since we have negative gamma price going up one dollar is going to cause the deltas to decrease not increase now because we are in a negative gamma so dealers deltas are going to actually decrease so as price goes up dealer deltas decrease de dealers deltas decrease and they are going to have to buy more in order to stay hedged and so when that happens they are actually supporting the price so if price goes up dealers are also buying because their deltas are further uh, decreasing and if price goes down their deltas are increasing so they're going to short so then price is going down they're shorting as well so that can cause a momentum effect so these are some fairly uh, non concepts that you might have read somewhere else and i just wanted to discuss them before we go into slightly more involved topics so now i believe uh, you know about what gamma is what gamma exposure is how do we calculate it uh, what what's delta what's the role of delta what's static hedging then what's dynamic hedging uh, now we are going to talk about the pros and cons of how some people uh, how some products or how some platforms calculate uh, gamma exposure versus how we calculate it 
So most of the time, what people do is they take in the gamma of a contract and multiply it with the open interest. And then they assume that all calls are sold and all puts are bought, which means uh, deal for, for dealers, uh, calls are going to give them positive uh, gamma and puts are going to give them negative gamma because customers are selling calls. So customers are short gamma, dealers are long gammas and customers are buying puts. So customers are long gamma on the put side, dealers are short gamma uh, on the put side. That's a very, very uh, fairly uh, basic assumption. And I hope you recognize that uh, there is definitely not a case where all calls are sold, sold, all puts are bought. And the reason this sort of uh, theory arrived was because most institutions, uh, they are long S&P shares. So in order to hedge that, they can do two, two things. In order to hedge that or earn extra yield, they can do two things. In order to hedge that, they can buy puts. In order to earn some extra yield, they can sell calls. So that's where this theory of like people are always selling calls or institutions are always selling calls, buying puts uh, came from. It's valid to some extent, but it's not uh, true, especially for individual stocks and even for uh, indices as well. So what we do is we have something called a dealer open interest where we look at each position and we look at whether that position was actually bought or sold. So let's say there are 500, the, the open interest for a contract is 500. And then we actually go ahead, look at all the individual trades that amounted to a 500 open interest. Remember, open interest is just the number of open contracts. It could be contracts that were bought to open or that were sold, that were sold to open. So we go, we go into individual trade and then we look at whether, whether trades were bought positions or sold positions. Then we sum them up and the net sort of value that we get is the true dealer open interest or customer open interest and then based on that we calculate our gamma exposures our one exposures and things like that so that's a slightly better way we believe of uh, calculating gamma exposure there are more sophisticated ways of actually using implied volatility surfaces that's something that we are working on right now but we don't have in the platform i believe the way we, we look at the bid ask and sort of whether the trade was a bought position or a sold position that still works uh, pretty well it's much better than the very simple assumption of all calls being sold, all puts being bought. And so that's what we have. But I think I have talked enough about these uh, sort of concepts and I haven't really uh, talked about how do you actually use gamma, gamma exposure from uh, our platform. And I would hope most people are here for that. So now let's actually go to the JEX uh, or the gamma exposure. So we are going to talk about the total JEX first and then we are going to talk about the strike base. First. So this is the total JEX. Uh, for S and P, and then on the on the x-axis we have the on the x-axis we have normalized JEX, which is the value of JEX divided by the max value of JEX over the last one year. So this just gives us a range of one to minus one, and then we have on the y-axis the future price change of one day, two day, three day, whatever parameter you have set here. So right now we are looking at what was the value of JEX and what happened the next day. You can see here that if JEX is extremely negative, then price is actually being pinned. And this is where I have such an unpopular opinion. Uh, most of the papers or the blogs or the videos that you see are going to tell you that gamma exposure, when it is very negative, and it makes logical sense that when it is very negative, it should cause some momentum effects. But when you go and look at the data for s and we are just talking about SPY. For SPX, all the things that we talk about that we talked about actually hold true. Very negative gamma does give you more volatility, but S and P or SPY is an index as well. It's a very liquid index. So many people trade options in S and P, but I have never read a paper or a, I've watched a video or read a blog post that actually talks about the fact that gamma exposure for different stocks has very different profiles very different volatility and movement profiles. So for S&P, anytime we have very negative gamma, we are not really getting momentum plays. What we are getting is a very pinning, a very good pinning effect in the market. Anytime we have very low gamma, gamma close to zero, gamma exposure close to zero, that's where we are getting the big moves. Again, each dot is a percentage change the next day. So it's a future price change. What happened the next day if JEX today was 0 or minus 0 0.5 or minus 1.0? Uh, 
and you can see how this is like fanning out as we go towards zero gamma or a very very slightly positive gamma uh, this is causing more volatility and I spent a lot of time just making sure that this graph was valid and I wasn't making a mistake and I am not because when you actually look at SPX if you can just go to S SPX I won't do that because that'll take a lot of time but you, you can just go to SPX here and look at the gamma exposure there their gamma exposure does as we are in when we are ne in negative gamma exposure territories we have more volatility but for s and p this is what we mostly trade we don't trade spx for s and p the profile is slightly different and that's where this whole concept of you need to look at the data for a for each stock before you begin to internalize or learn patterns for that stock there is no the markets are so complex these days that there is no single piece of information that you can learn and just extrapolate it to every single stock out there that just does not work and that's the first that's the first unpopular opinion each stock has an individual gamma exposure profile has an individual correlation to how price moves with different gamma exposure levels and this tells us that as a gamma exposure becomes gamma exposure for s and p becomes close to zero we get more volatility that's a very very powerful concept because more volatility gives us greater reward and greater risk so in the days when you have more volatility you want to be ready you want to be making big plays like you want to be on top of your game and you want to also contain your risk but in days where volatility is like very low or the change in the price is going to be very low which is what we are calling volatility here you can probably just stay out of the market and just expect some chop in the market i hope you can realize that as if you can predict that if you can predict how much price is going to move tomorrow that is a very very powerful thing for both options traders and for any other kind of trader as well so this chart uh, we also have a bar chart distribution based on this chart so the higher the bars uh, the more volatility we are expecting the next day if you want to look at the how does uh, price changes uh, in five days uh, very similar correlations where uh, as we move towards zero gamma price starts to uh, change quite a lot the volatility increases and then we have this price distribution we have discussed that in length in our dealer positioning video but uh, we have talked about now a uh, total gamma exposure and how does it relate to price movements okay let's actually look at spx we just added data for S spx uh, a couple of weeks ago so the, the the dashboard is somewhat missing which is why i did not want to sort of go into the details here but still let's talk about it so let's go to gamma so here you can see that uh, as we move towards positive gamma we are squeezed a lot and if you zoom this chart out you can't do that here but i did it on my laptop you can see that these bars are much higher than these bars so in reality what we are seeing is uh, volatility increases a lot as we do move towards the negative gamma exposure for dealers level which makes sense which we talked about uh, but i just want to emphasize that since markets are so, so complex and we have no idea what's the relationship relationship between spx options and spy options and how are people uh, sort of trading these interrelatedly so there could be a more logical explanation but you have the data just look at it uh, and know that there are certain differences in and uh, different stocks different pairs of tickers different indices uh, different things like that so for spx most of what you read uh, online is true but for other stocks even for uh, S spy it is not true so let's go back to spy now okay so it's it's a really nice chart because it helps us predict volatility that spx chart was a bit cluttered as you just saw so i often use spy to predict how volatile the next day is going to be now that we uh, have uh, an anticipation of volatility uh, i want to mention that when you are looking at total GX, do not use it. Do not use the total gamma exposure to predict the direction of the move. That is where a lot of people make sort of try to use this. They try to use this price distribution chart. You cannot use the price distribution chart when the correlation between the next day's move and the GX is like 0 0.012. That's like zero. So that's telling you that there is no predictive power. In the direction in the directional prediction for jacks 
but there is a lot of predictive power for volatility prediction which is why you are seeing this nice fanning out pattern as we go to right the graph starts to expand that's total gx and that gives you a very good estimate of future volatility that's again very useful now let's talk about uh, gamma exposure per each strike because that's what uh, that's like the hot thing these days and a lot of people talk about it i've spent the last four weeks just dealing with gamma exposure levels now let's go to them these are the gamma exposure levels and then the white line is simply a sum of each level in a cumulative way so i'm going to hide it by clicking here this is what you are seeing uh, the gamma exposure levels are what you are seeing right now the white the white bars are where we are at right now the green bars are where gamma exposure is positive red bars is where gamma exposure is negative and we have talked about what happens when gamma exposure is negative and what happens when gamma exposure is positive negative causes momentum positive causes uh, mean reversion now the very first thing that we saw with s and p was our, our sort of logical explanation on what happens with positive and negative gamma did not hold true for spy it held true for S, S, uh, spx but just for the sake of discussion here because i think like this is so important to discuss on like different stocks having different profiles let's still stick with this chart obviously i think you might be wanting me to go to spx chart we can probably do another video for that just sort of analyzing the gamma exposure levels for that but but i want to stick with spy because i've spent so much time with this and okay we have the positive levels we have the negative levels, and these are just based on uh, you find the open interest in a way that we calculate open interest then just multiply uh, it with gamma for each strike and just sum it up across all contracts for that strike and this chart is what we're getting but this chart is looking very very different from the charts that you might see on other platforms or online or somewhere else because this chart is all squished down to these small bars why is there so much empty space here now let me go through some uh, very unpopular but data driven insights so most people uh, say that when we have negative gamma as price move towards it uh, it causes these momentum effects so if if there is a very large negative gamma let's assume at 392 then as price let's say starts to move down from 40 400 to 399 to 398 it might quickly move towards the 392 because again it's negative gamma so as price is moving towards it that gamma and the deltas are going to increase or decrease based on what the color is uh, are, are going to actually sort of it's going to cause a momentum effect because it's a negative gamma and dealers are going to support whatever move is happening uh, and and we have discussed that and uh, one thing that i wanted to discuss was like this is how gamma looks so as we go close to those bars as we go close uh, to at the money or in the money these gammas are going to like have start going to a peak so this is a bell shaped curve which means once we reach at that bar gamma is maximum but once we reach uh, once we reach like ahead or uh, behind it like anytime we are ahead or behind that bar gamma is uh, gamma starts to decrease so at that bar is where gamma is going to be maximum but as we are let's let's assume this is a very big bar red bar it's going down as we are reaching towards that bar you can see how gamma keeps increasing 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 and if we are in a negative gamma regime then that negative gamma keeps increasing 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 and that can cause that can cause those deltas to change immensely or massively and that can cause these momentum effects but once we reach that particular strike that's where uh, now the gamma is maximum so there is no more momentum effect so when i started learning about gamma exposure levels i always thought that once we reach these negative gamma strikes that's where the momentum is going to start that's not true at all once we are reaching towards these negative gamma strikes is where uh, we are going to have some momentum effects once we reach this green because there is positive gamma on those strikes then we are going to start to like price is going to start to do the opposite uh, mms are going market makers are going to start to do the opposite of what price is doing so it can quickly repel the price or cause some pinning effect that's that's the theory behind uh, trying to choose a uh, gamma exposure levels uh, anytime you see red you are expecting the price to have some momentum when it's going towards those red levels anytime you see a positive level then you are expecting the price uh, to start to at least stop or go towards the opposite direction as it starts reaching those uh, green bars 
we have a really good approximate we have a really good variation of this which we call spot jacks where anytime uh, so all the negative gamma levels above the current stock price are converted to positive gamma levels or or the positives are converted to negative so we flip the gamma levels above the current price so that if there is a gamma level if there is a negative gamma level above the current price it becomes green and it looks like it can cause a momentum effect or it can cause a bullish move so these all all of these green levels were actually red as you can see but these red levels if we moved towards them were going to cause a momentum effect so we just turned them like we just flipped them and now they are, they have become green because they they were above the current price anything that's below the current stock price so we'll still keep acting uh, as it is if there is a red level below the current price then again it's a negative level it can cause momentum effects but if a red level is above the current stock price it can cause a bullish momentum effect and that's what we color green instead of red on the normal gx chart and the green ones are going to cause some resistance so we turn them we flip them as well and that can cause some resistance now so it just makes reading gamma exposure very easy okay we have talked about the basic concepts of how to analyze these bars and like that's all you need to know but i was thinking like if this is that easy then why not build some automated strategies anytime we have let's say a red bar and we start going towards it let's uh, just like ha create a momentum play or create sort of a moving average or trend uh, strategy and then anytime we reach a green bar let's stop let's exit and that should work well that does work well but there were so many caveats that i learned over the last four weeks and we are going to discuss those today so one the very first lesson that i learned was all the charts that you see that you saw online on trader tricks and that you still see online on many other platforms and i'm not really honestly trying to knock down any other platform i'm just trying to convey what i learned and how it was so important anytime you see a gamma exposure chart like the one that you're seeing uh, right now let's go to the normal gamma exposure these charts are meaningless if they are not drawn in a relative term let me explain why or let me explain what does uh, what do i mean so let's assume this red bar was a gamma exposure of minus 200 million in notional value let's assume that meant any time price went up one dollars market makers had to invest 200 million dollars in buying s p shares okay uh, that's useful like we know that market 200 million dollars is a lot of money so market makers will support us price will have a momentum effect but how do you know 200 million dollars is a lot of money you don't you, like if you are a retail trader then honestly you, you don't really know that because for spx even if there is like 20 billion dollar gamma level it will still not be able to move the price more than like 0.5 or even like a one percent and these are just some sort of uh, statistics that i've seen in the data like there is no logical explanation but uh, the, the point of telling you this is like even if these gamma levels are huge it is very hard to cause big moves that happens with individual stocks but let's just say for the sake of uh, S&P, it is very hard for GameStop and individual stocks. Sure, it happens sometimes and Gamma can cause squeezes in both ways up and down. So that's a topic for another time. But let's just talk about uh, S&P. So now you don't really know what $200 million for S&P and $500 million and $100 million in Gamma exposure, which is again, Gamma multiplied by 100 multiplied by the open interest. Just sum it up. That's the Gamma exposure. We multiply it with sort of stock price and then uh, 0 0.01 multiplied by stock price that calculation is done in order to like uh, predict how much gamma is going to how how much dealers are going to sort of short or go long uh, in dollar value if price moves up let's say one percent though that just some some details that you can you just ignore what i said in the last one minute if you did not understand it but uh, the point is like it is useless if you're looking at a gamma exposure uh, chart and it is not in relative terms it's just in plain terms like the, the, hey here is minus 100 million dollars uh, gamma exposure here is 500 million dollars gamma exposure in positive in negative whatever that is not useful and again i'm not trying to knock down anything else i'm just trying to tell you that i've done so many experiments and 
looking at these absolute gamma levels, looking at these levels in absolute terms of what their value is, is not meaningful. Okay, why is that? Because any time, let's say 100 million, uh, let's say there is a level that's for, let's, that, that has a value of 100 million in gamma exposure. Let's say the average value of a level for the same stock, let's say for S&P, over the last two months, has been $600 million. Now, if you are not looking at those values every single day, you would have no idea that the average value of each bar here was $600 million. And you would, just, you would just look at that 100 million. And if at that day, that 100 million was the highest level, then you would just think that, hey, this is a big level price will main revert from here because this is a big green level. That's absolutely useless because that is 100 versus the 600 average, 600 million average levels that we typically get. So that level is so small for that particular stock for S&P here that it is not going to cause anything like that level is completely meaningless. And I cannot emphasize this enough as when the relative value of these levels is small, these levels are completely meaningless. It's when the relative value, the relative value being the value of this, the total value of the, the jacks of this level or, or of this bar for this particular strike is greater than the mean average value of, let's say, the total jacks that we get for S&P or for these bars. If it's greater than the mean, if it's like, let's say, two, uh, like 50% greater or like two times greater or even just greater than the mean, that's where like those are the bars that we need to take care about and so all of these bars that we're seeing here are sitting at like 0 0.1 to minus 0 0.1 which is like the value of the bar divided by the total average checks for s p this is very very small and now here is where like i see a lot of people doing like going to misleading conclusions so now that we know that these these like the chart that we are seeing is not that meaningless uh, is not that meaningful sorry now if we go to s p we can see that uh, we went to 402 401 and then we had a big move from 401 all the way to 390 and many people will look at this chart if this was like a full chart and we did not cap it or we did not sort of uh, reduced the size of these bars just because their relative value was small People would uh, look at it and they would say that, hey, 400, 401 were green levels. So we, th there was some main reversion from there. And then these were all red levels. So there was some momentum effect. Then maybe we had to, maybe we expected some resistance at 394, which we did not really get. M maybe we expected some support at 394, which we did not really like fully get. And then there was a red level and then maybe we expected some support at 392 and then we expected uh, the price to quickly uh, reach 392 and then we expected a strong support at 390. Now that's what this chart is telling you and if you look at the price that's somewhat what happened that day we went to 390 we found support there but but like the unpopular opinion here is that was not caused by gamma exposure and i know i'll get some flack for it and i know many people will not agree with me but i am a data scientist and i have to say things that i see with data this move was not caused by gamma exposure it might have been caused by some other exposure such as van exposure charm some other kind of uh, some other thing in the market but it was not caused by gamma exposure because gamma was very very small throughout the entire day so gamma exposure was not strong enough to cause any momentum or any main reversion moves it does look like that but i was talking about this with many of our users if you want to replace gamma levels without knowing any gamma exposure values just draw a line just draw a support line at every round number so 400 390 380 370 and then even to like five uh, as well 400 395 390 385 and you'll find that those levels work pretty well those are not like because of gamma levels that's just because most of the options contracts are, are traded at these round values 
So there is just like a lot of dealers sitting on those positions and that can cause as price moves then we have van exposure charm exposure so there are a lot of complex forces in the market that can cause those price those levels to become levels of interest it is not just because of gamma and it is not due to gamma exposure alone in this case i believe it was not because of gamma exposure at all and that's the hot take from this video and i hope uh, you'll think about it and, and you'll do some do, you'll do your own analysis and you'll come up with different conclusions now if this level was a huge level let's say if this was a huge red level it was going towards minus 0 0.5 that's a significant value anything greater than 0 0.5 just empirically i've seen that it's a significant value now if these bars were very very big then if we had a move similar to what we had then we might have been able to say that yes that move was probably caused by gamma exposure not not here but now when if these red bars were huge then what would happen what would we expect is as price starts to let's say come down we would expect these red and uh, this is important so please listen carefully we would expect these red big red levels to act as magnets they'll act as magnets until price reaches towards them and then they will not cause a momentum effect once the price reaches towards them this is something that i did not get when i started looking at gamma i always thought that price will cruise through these levels it doesn't these red levels negative gamma especially for s p can cause even for other stocks and again you can do your own analysis here but this is what i have observed and learned these big negative gamma exposure levels can cause the cause the stock to come towards them and that happens because this is how the gamma distribution looks it peaks at these uh, at the exact value of these strikes because we are coming towards them so gamma keeps increasing but once we are at uh, once we are at them gamma is not going to increase anymore okay so now what happens is price can quickly come to these levels but it can sometimes have a hard time going away from these levels because let's assume this was a big red level so price came towards it quickly now it starts to let's say uh, there are some other red levels so it starts to go towards them but anytime it even makes a small move back this red level has still a lot of negative gamma so any move is going to get exacerbated so if we start moving back then this red gamma since it's very negative it's going to pull price towards it again so instead of causing a momentum effect once we reach it it is going to cause a magnet effect so it is actually going to try to pin the price on a big red level people think that these big green levels are going to cause this that's not necessarily true when we reach these big let's now assume again these levels were big they were high they were not really small when we reach a uh, high green levels now any time price even starts to divert from them that price is going to divert a little bit more especially if there are red levels around these green levels so in my analysis what i've observed is that when we are moving towards red uh, bars that can cause a momentum effect but once we are at big red bars that can cause a, cause a pinning effect when we are moving when we are not moving when we are at these green bars they are going to repel the price because market makers are no, no, now going against what the price is doing so that can cause actually a repelling effect where once we reach this we are going to even like this day you can see that we ended the day on the red bar not on the green bar let's assume this was a big gamma day and this was all because of gamma exposure you can still see that like if you don't agree with what i said earlier on on the relative value even if this is the chart that you were looking at you can still see that we closed on a big negative gamma level not on a big positive gamma level and that's uh, basically it for the video and it probably went a little bit much longer than what i had anticipated but i had so many thoughts because i've been like knee deep uh, into all the analysis of, on how to actually use gamma exposure most people use gamma exposure for s p for spy not for spx but uh, i would love for other people to now go ahead use some of these findings and actually see how they work with 
SPX. I would hope they work very similar, especially the one where we are talking about these strikes and the relative value of these strikes and the bars and things like that and things. But that's it uh, for the video. The last two things that I'll discuss is that we do have filters uh, to filter for gamma exposure that's expiring within seven days, within 15 days, within 30 days. Many people want to use these filters. I'll be very honest. I don't think there is a lot of value in using a day still expiration filter because gamma is already very concentrated in near term expirations. So there is no use of using a day still expiration filter when the thing that you're looking at is already concentrated in shorter term expirations. So most people like there are so many, I believe, misconceptions about how to actually use gamma levels and we have discussed some of them. But some people still want to use these filters and sure uh, there is some gamma obviously in slightly longer term contracts as well. So you might want to skip that for shorter term moves. Sure, you can do you can do that. Uh, uh, but yeah, I, I don't think there is much value in there. So we have talked about gamma, gamma exposure. Uh, why don't we uh, talk about delta exposure? How do people calculate gamma exposure, total gamma exposure and when to use it and then strike based gamma exposure and how to use it. Uh, we have talked about different variations, spot checks, then checks, and then we have talked about talked about some filters. Uh, I will, uh, I would like to quickly go through one example here. So this is uh, the gamma exposure. Uh, these are the gamma exposure levels for IWM. Uh, these were bigger than S and P, so that's why I'm discussing them. You can see uh, one thing that we have recently introduced or sort of discovered is that anytime we have these like low uh, gamma exposure bars that region is an illiquid region so we are assuming that market makers are not sitting strongly during those regions where we have low gamma exposure and let's also assume low other exposure such as van and sham exposure that is what we call an illiquid zone and illiquid zones are we as customers or traders really want it's not the large gamma zones or the large Vanna zones that we want. Sure, we'll do some analysis, we'll do more analysis, we'll talk about them. But right now, uh, where we are standing, I believe we want these illiquid zones because market makers are not doing anything in those zones. And we can probably get much faster moves once we are passing through those zones or once we are in those zones. And this is just an example. Uh, so this zone, this gray zone, is what we call an illiquid zone because there was not much gamma in there. You can see price quickly moved here and then this was obviously a resistance level. We had some resistance. We very made, we very quickly made a down move as well. So this was now since this has, this had slightly bigger gamma levels. Uh, you can see price quickly moved towards this level and then obviously we would expect some kind of, uh, once price was starting to move up, we would expect some kind of resistance if price moved. Uh, we, we would expect some kind of sort of a pullback as the price moved just a little bit down, which we did not get here. Uh, then the price uh, went down and you can see like both this level and this level, uh, this level was actually, I believe the highest level. Both of these levels quickly pulled the price towards them. But then anytime price did anything else and it just came back a little bit, this level would uh, quickly pull it towards uh, towards itself as well. And that happened like here, 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 here. So you can see like price quickly reaches these levels, but once it starts going uh, below or uh, above these levels, then these levels at least try to pull the price towards them. And then anytime we are in these illiquid zones, uh, that's where the price can uh, slightly move freely. So let's actually look at SPY because I do think we had an illiquid zone here. So I'll just draw the gamma exposure levels. Okay, so this is the zone that we, I am talking about. So we had some, let's say gamma at 392, then at 396, 398 and 400. Sure, let's just skip those gamma levels because they were very low. I believe, now I'm just wrapping up the entire video. I believe some of this move was probably caused by some factors. Sure, include gamma exposure as well if you want to, but I think the move from about 400 all the way to about 392 was actually caused because of illiquid regions, not because of gamma exposure. Because there was, let's say there were no dealers 
sitting on big positions here so they no hedging was required price could do whatever it wants to do without dealers being involved and that's always a good thing we don't want them to be involved all the time because they are doing all kind of hedging and there are not just gamma hedging there is like vanna hedging and charm hedging so that can cause like weird effects and since that's such a complex topic it it's much easier for us when they are not there at all and that's where these illiquid regions come in i do believe like from here onwards to here uh, till till this level we had a very illiquid region and that caused the price to quickly go down i don't think it was the negative gamma strikes or it was the negative gamma that we had i think it was the illiquid so and with that i'll stop this video because it has already gone very very long uh, thank you so much if you have uh, made it this far like that that was so much information and sometimes i i believe i went on a rant because like i had so many things on my mind uh, so i hope this was still useful for you and this gave you some perspective on how to actually use gamma levels if you do want to use them but then how to actually navigate through the pros and cons of gamma and gamma exposure and gamma levels uh, and again i just hope this is useful for everyone i hope you have some idea on how to actually use our gamma levels and yeah just uh, you i hope you learned a couple of things from this video thank you so much for watching this i will see you guys around